The remnants of an ancient salty ocean lie buried beneath the icy crust of the dwarf planet Ceres. Or, at the very least, there are pockets of salty water present. This was the conclusion of scientists after analyzing data from the Dawn spacecraft, the first mission to explore two objects in the asteroid belt. Unsurprisingly, Ceres quickly became an enticing target for future research. It is not just the largest asteroid, it is more like a protoplanet, a world that never gathered enough mass to become like Earth or Mars. In this respect, Ceres is not unique within the inner solar system. However, scientists are still uncertain about its origins. This remarkable object, with bright spots and organic material on its surface, might not have formed in the asteroid belt at all, but rather in an entirely different location. So today, I invite you on a journey to one of the most intriguing worlds in the asteroid belt. In the second half of the 18th century, a fascinating empirical formula emerged in astronomy, proposed by two German astronomers, Johann Bode and Johann Titius. Their simple mathematical expressions seem to quite accurately describe the distances between the planets of the solar system known at the time. However, this formula truly stirred the astronomical community after William Herschel's historic discovery of Uranus. It turned out that the orbit of the new planet precisely matched the distance predicted by the so-called Titius-Bode rule. One can only imagine the excitement of astronomers who realized that this rule also predicted the existence of another yet undiscovered planet lurking somewhere nearby between Mars and Jupiter. By the end of the 18th century, a group of 24 astronomers decided to join forces to find this elusive world as quickly as possible. Modestly calling themselves the Celestial Police, they worked diligently. However, before this group could make their historic discovery, they were outpaced by a modest astronomer and Catholic priest from Italy named Giuseppe Piazzi. Before receiving an invitation to join the Celestial Police, on the first day of the new year 1801, Piazzi discovered the missing planet at the Palermo Observatory. Initially, while observing the motion of a star-like object, Piazzi thought he had spotted a comet, but its orbit seemed unusual. The object moved slowly and steadily, which, as Piazzi understood, suggested it was something better than a comet. When his observations were published in the second half of the year, the new planet had become difficult to observe due to the sun's glare. Other astronomers finally spotted the object later that year, after accurately calculating its orbit. Orbiting at a distance of 2.8 astronomical units from the Sun, Piazzi's planet appeared to once again confirm the validity of the Titius-Bode rule. However, after Neptune's discovery in 1846, astronomers concluded that the match between predicted and actual orbits was coincidental, as the rule failed for Neptune. The icy giant was found to be eight astronomical units closer than the rule had predicted. Giuseppe Piazzi named his discovery Ceres Ferdinandea after the Roman goddess of grain and agriculture, as well as in honor of Ferdinand, the king of Sicily. However, due to political reasons, the second part of the name was dropped, and the first part became widely accepted. Thus, from the very beginning, Ceres was classified as a planet. In fact, it held this status for over 50 years, imagine that, but shared it with a few of its neighbors. The reason is that around the same time, between 1802 and 1807, astronomers discovered three similar objects, Pallas, Juno, and Vesta. This was already too many to be considered planets. Since all these objects were similar, particularly being much smaller than the other planets, astronomers began to suspect they were observing a new class of objects. The term asteroid, meaning star-like in Greek, was proposed by William Herschel, who was the first to challenge the planetary nature of Ceres and its companions. Of course, not everyone agreed with him. In fact, astronomical literature continued to list 11 planets for several decades. However, starting in 1845, the number of new objects in Ceres' orbit began to grow rapidly, which could no longer be ignored. Thus, from the mid 19th century, all such objects were classified differently from planets and referred to in astronomical literature as minor planets or asteroids. The term asteroid belt also came into use, with Ceres as its largest member. Finally, in 2006, when poor Pluto lost its planetary status and a new class of celestial bodies was introduced, Ceres was included in this category, becoming the closest dwarf planet to Earth. This object orbits the Sun in a nearly circular path, located three times farther than Earth's orbit. 
At that distance, sunlight takes 22 minutes to reach its surface. Ceres completes a full orbit around the Sun in more than 4.5 Earth years, traveling near the center of the asteroid belt. Its orbit has a slight inclination relative to the plane of the solar system, but is less tilted than Pluto's orbit. Ceres rotates around its axis in just 9.1 hours, giving it one of the shortest days in the solar system. Overall, it has a spherical shape, but is somewhat flattened at the poles. In fact, it is the smallest and least massive of all the dwarf planets. With a diameter of only 939 kilometers, Ceres is two and a half times smaller than Pluto and three and a half times smaller than the Moon. This means it is difficult to see with the naked eye, even at its brightest point in orbit. Moreover, despite being the largest object in the asteroid belt, it is not the brightest. That honor belongs to the second largest asteroid, Vesta, whose orbit lies closer to Earth than Ceres, and which has a much higher albedo. Nonetheless, in terms of size and mass, Ceres is unmatched in the asteroid belt. It accounts for 40% of the belt's total mass. However, this might seem surprising. Ceres is still relatively light for a 950 kilometer wide rock. Its overall density is just over two grams per cubic centimeter, suggesting that at least a quarter of it must consist of water ice. This is highly unusual for asteroids in the inner solar system. If Ceres is indeed a water-rich world rather than, say, a porous chunk of rock, the amount of water it contains could exceed that on Earth. This makes Ceres yet another highly compelling target for exploration. In 2014, the Herschel Space Telescope detected water vapor surrounding the dwarf planet. The spectral signatures of water were quite clear and appeared periodically. Of course, scientists saw no reason to hope that this body might have a liquid ocean beneath its surface, like Europa or Enceladus. However, it indicated that Ceres' surface does indeed have a significant amount of water ice, which can sublimate under solar radiation. In any case, it was quite unexpected to observe something in the asteroid belt emitting plumes of water vapor. Asteroids simply don't do that. This is a characteristic of icy comets. Still, the greatest scientific interest in Ceres lies in its status as a protoplanet, a precious remnant of the early history of the solar system's formation. It is believed that billions of years ago, along with Vesta and Pallas, Ceres avoided becoming the core of a larger planet. Jupiter, migrating closer to the Sun, likely played a role in scattering most of the material in the asteroid belt. Thus, having halted their evolution, these three protoplanets became the largest objects in the asteroid belt. These building blocks of the solar system's planets are of great scientific interest, and the asteroid belt's relative proximity means lower costs for a potential mission to explore them. It's no surprise, then, that NASA decided to send a spacecraft as part of its discovery program, a series of low-cost missions aimed at studying the solar system. Additionally, NASA wanted to further test its ion propulsion technology, first trialed on the Deep Space One probe. The new mission was named Dawn, a reference to the dawn of the solar system. The mission targeted the two largest objects in the asteroid belt, Ceres and Vesta. These two protoplanets are actually quite different. Vesta is dry, while Ceres is wet, suggesting they evolved along divergent paths. This makes them particularly fascinating for understanding how planets form. The mission launched in 2007, and in 2011, the spacecraft reached Vesta, Notably, it didn't just fly past the large asteroid, but entered orbit around it, where it remained for 14 months. It then set off towards Ceres, arriving in 2015. The spacecraft continued its mission there for another three years until it ran out of fuel. Dawn made history as the first spacecraft to orbit two celestial bodies. Ceres immediately began teasing astronomers with its intriguing features, even before the spacecraft had approached it. In the initial still blurry images, astronomers observed a gray, heavily cratered surface and, of course, several large bright spots. These bright spots are a signature feature of Ceres, as they had been known for some time, even appearing in images from the Hubble Space Telescope. However, their nature remained a mystery. As it turned out, as expected, these spots became the focal point of scientists' efforts to understand this world. These spots, called faculae, are most prominently found in the 92-kilometer-wide Akator Crater. Another of the most noticeable spots was found in Haolani Crater, one of Ceres' youngest craters. Over the course of the mission, Dawn identified more than 130 bright spots of various sizes, 
most of which are located in the centers of craters. The origin of these spots was a particularly intriguing question. Of course, the simplest interpretation was that they were ordinary ice, possibly the result of cryovolcanic eruptions or exposed subsurface water ice. However, as the spacecraft drew closer and image quality improved, scientists developed new hypotheses. Eventually, they concluded that the spots had nothing to do with ice at all. In 2015, preliminary spectroscopic data from the spacecraft revealed that the spots were more likely deposits of magnesium sulfate salts. Sunlight striking these deposits enhanced their brightness. However, more detailed analyses showed that the salts had a slightly different chemical composition, primarily consisting of sodium carbonate and bicarbonate, essentially common soda. This was intriguing, as the presence of such deposits suggests the existence of salty liquid, or brine, that must have seeped to the surface. The water would have evaporated quickly, leaving behind the white residue. What's more, this activity appeared to have occurred relatively recently, as the spots remain bright and have not been covered by dust from micrometeorite impacts. But where does this liquid come from? Could Ceres be yet another potentially water-rich world in the solar system, and one significantly closer to Earth than the others we know? Ceres, of course, lacks the advantage of internal heating caused by the gravitational pull of a massive planet, as is the case for the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. Instead, scientists link the presence of liquid to the craters where most of these bright spots are found. About 20 million years ago, the impact that created Akator Crater may have melted a large quantity of the ice and salts abundant in Ceres' surface. The upper layers of the crater would have quickly frozen, forming a crust, but beneath it, enough residual heat might have remained to keep the crater's interior liquid. A reservoir of salty water, with its lower freezing point, could have existed about 20 kilometers below the surface. Fractures created by the impact might have served as channels through which the briny water gradually seeped to the surface, forming the bright spots. The source of Ceres' cryovolcanic activity is unlikely to be purely melted water. It is believed that brine still flow through its outer mantle, periodically reaching the surface. At least one trace of such activity rises four kilometers above the surface the highest mountain on the dwarf planet, named Ahuna Mons. Discovered in 2015 in images from the Dawn spacecraft, estimates of its height range around 4 kilometers, with a width of about 20 kilometers. Scientists quickly identified the mountain as resembling a cryovolcano due to its dome-like shape, which is similar to volcanoes on Earth. However, instead of molten rock, this volcano erupted with cold molten ice, salts, and clays, a very exotic type of cryovolcanism. Ahuna Mons appears to be a relatively young cryovolcano, no older than 200 million years, as suggested by its shape and the sparse number of craters on its surface. Intriguingly, it is unique. No other similar structure has been found on the surface of Ceres. This is puzzling since it suggests that the dwarf planet was geologically dormant for millions of years before suddenly erupting with cryovolcanic activity in just one location. If geological activity is ongoing, there should be other volcanoes. But where are they? In 2017, a group of scientists modeled how cryovolcanic domes might change over time on a body like Ceres. They discovered that older cryovolcanoes might simply have been erased due to a process known as viscoelastic relaxation. Imagine a viscous substance, like putty. It can hold a shape, but over time, under its own weight, it gradually flattens. Based on data from the Dawn mission, scientists know that Ceres is a differentiated body, meaning its interior is divided into layers. The crust, which overlays an icy mantle, is a viscous mix of rock, ice, and salts. Over time, this crust can flow like a viscous liquid, erasing surface features. Glaciers on Earth behave in a similar way. Although Ceres is colder than Earth, making its ice harder at the equator, where there is more solar radiation, the ice is slightly softer and moves more actively than at the poles. Scientists concluded that other cryovolcanoes were simply worn down beyond recognition, becoming smaller, wider, and rounder over time. Using archival data from the spacecraft, they identified at least 22 mountains that matched the models of eroded volcanoes. This process could have taken a relatively short time, from several tens to hundreds of millions of years. Interestingly, Ceres may have erased its largest craters in a similar manner. Scientists were surprised to find that among the many impact basins, there were no truly giant craters over 400 kilometers in diameter. 
According to calculations, there should be more than a dozen such craters. This is strange because Ceres' evolution in the asteroid belt would have involved major collisions, leaving behind significant scars. For example, the largest crater on Vesta has a diameter of around 500 kilometers, while Vesta itself has a mean diameter of 505 kilometers. Similarly, many other asteroids in the belt bear marks of impacts with comparably sized bodies. Yet on Ceres, the largest impact basin, Kirwan, measures less than 300 kilometers in diameter, 284 kilometers to be precise. This suggests that a significant portion of the dwarf planet's large craters was erased due to crustal deformation, in the same way large cryovolcanoes disappeared from its surface. However, in my opinion, the most fascinating insight from the mission to the two protoplanets is the realization that Ceres might not originate from the asteroid belt at all. While it is indeed unique due to its rich reservoir of water ice, there are other intriguing clues. For example, sodium carbonate. In fact, one of the few other places outside Earth where astronomers have detected its presence is in the plumes erupting from the surface of icy Enceladus, the intriguing moon of Saturn with a subsurface ocean. Additionally, spectroscopic studies of Ceres' surface revealed traces of ammonia near Akator Crater. Ammonia is a highly volatile compound and is scarce in the inner solar system, where solar radiation is still significant. However, in more distant regions beyond the so-called snow line, ammonia is abundant. So, how did it end up on Ceres? One possibility is that these compounds were delivered to the dwarf planet after its formation, during a time when objects from the outer reaches of the system migrated closer to the sun. Yet it is hard to imagine that they all targeted Ceres alone, especially since such materials are not observed on other asteroids. Considering this and the surprisingly high proportion of ice in Ceres' composition, there is a hypothesis that it did not originate in its current orbit. It might be one of many icy planetesimals that once orbited the Sun in the outer regions of the system, near the giant planets. Through the gravitational dances of these planets, Ceres could have been ejected from its original home and sent closer to the Sun. Eventually, it found its place in the asteroid belt, serving today as an extraordinary witness to those turbulent ancient times. Regardless of its origin, Ceres is a captivating and intriguing world. It has evidence of geological activity, liquid water beneath its surface, and even organic molecules. These molecules were detected in large quantities near Ernutet Crater, highlighted in images as red-colored regions. They are aliphatic molecules, composed of chains of carbon and hydrogen, which are part of a class of chemicals essential for biochemistry. Although these organics were found relatively locally, in one specific region, the rest of Ceres' surface is also rich in carbon on a global scale. The fact that Ceres may have liquid water beneath its surface and organic compounds on its surface prompted the mission team to avoid directing the spacecraft to crash into the planet at the end of its mission. This was done to protect against the extremely unlikely but still possible existence of microbial life. The spacecraft remains in orbit around the dwarf planet on a stable trajectory, I believe humanity will return to Ceres. Any world with even a small chance of supporting life becomes a focal point for space exploration. The location of the asteroid belt also makes Ceres an attractive candidate for future missions. But there's another reason. Between Mars and Jupiter lies a vast reservoir of water and other volatile compounds. This is highly optimistic in terms of humanity's future expansion into the solar system. While this might not be good news for potential life, Ceres will undoubtedly play a key role both scientifically and in humanity's development as an interplanetary species.